Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another HydroTerra webinar. Really appreciate you all joining us today, another great crowd. Today, the topic is all about tailings dam monitoring. And we're joined by two people who have done a lot of work in this area. We've got Gavin Mudd from RMIT, who's an associate professor there. But more importantly, Gavin has a very strong background in hydrogeology and a PhD, which centered on a topic around tailings, uh, like these ash ponds uh, down in Gippsland. Um, but a wealth of experience also dealing with mine sites more generally, particularly from an oversight perspective. So really looking forward to his take on tailings management and where the world is at. Then we've got Steve, who has also got a huge amount of experience in the mining sector and in monitoring instrumentation. He's uh, currently working at HydroTerra as one of our principals in integrated systems. He's worked uh, very extensively with monitoring systems around tailings dams. So we've got Gavin, who can give us a sort of global perspective on what's required to improve, but also maybe the sources of problems with tailings. And we've got Steve who's got a lot of experience with how various failures, et cetera, are monitored on the ground. And between those two, I think it'll be a really good presentation. So thanks very much to both of you for joining us today. So I've gone over those. Before we charge into the actual presentation, a couple of things. So we love your questions and we've been getting lots of questions, which is great. Um, in terms of raising a question during this forum, if you can please use the Q&A button and type your questions in there. I will read those questions out to the speakers at the end of the presentation. And uh, between the three of us, we'll endeavor to answer them. If we can't answer them, We'll send you a email later on with the answer to the question. Why does HydroTerra like doing these webinars? Well, we actually really do enjoy sharing knowledge and love uh, getting speakers in who have a wealth of knowledge. We learn from it. They get to uh, expose their knowledge to the industry and the industry learns too. And I think together collaborating in this sort of forum does help everybody. We'd like to facilitate education. There's a bit of a shortage of really good applied training in some areas around this. And there's also a bit of a, a loss of a lot of knowledge from the industry um, with people retiring and that sort of thing. So we love to get that knowledge shared through the industry. So trying to help with educating. And we also like to bring new technologies in and, and show people what's coming and what's available that can be used to help provide some leadership around the technology application side of things. So we hope you enjoy it today. All right, so there's two sort of main parts to this topic. Gavin's going to lead us out talking about tailings dam construction techniques and failure modes. And then we shift over to Steve who's gonna uh, talk about instrumentation and monitoring, including the types of instrumentation, the installation and the data logging uh, side of those instruments, uh, including some telemetry. Um, then we'll move to Q&A, which um, if it's anything like the last webinar that went on for about 45 minutes. So hopefully we get plenty of questions from you today. So without further ado, I will pass over to Gavin, and thanks very much for joining us today. No worries. Good day, everyone, and uh, yeah, thanks, Richard. It's always uh, a pleasure, and I'm very happy to help here. I guess I've been looking at tailings dams for pretty much my whole professional life, and I guess there's a whole range of questions, but uh, it's a problem that hasn't gone away, and in many ways, it's actually getting you know, bigger, and, and you know, some people believe it's getting worse. Uh, but obviously, we need to be doing better, right? And so I think hopefully. Uh, my sort of short uh, you know, few slides here will help give you a, a better sense of that and uh, what we can do and then also why we need you know, better monitoring, I guess, as well. So next slide, thanks. There we go. 
Now, I think just as a, a framing point, I mean, obviously mining gives us the metals, the minerals, the, the energy that we need. And the technology that we're all listening to on this webinar is uh, probably a mix of about 60 different elements that make up either a laptop, whether it's the batteries, the screens, the, the circuit boards and everything else. And so let alone all of the infrastructure we have with our cars, our, our homes, our buildings and everything else. And so that comes at an environmental cost and that environmental cost with mining uh, you know, tailings is certainly one of the biggest uh, you know, areas plus waste rock as well, All right? And so depending on the mine and the metal, there's a, an enormous variability around all of the characteristics of tailings. Uh, but I think even uh, some of the more recent disasters such as Samarco have highlighted that even if something is not chemically toxic, it can still cause significant ecological impact because a tailing stand failure like Samarco you know, smothers an ecosystem, prevents light from getting in, uh, prevents uh, oxygen from uh, you know, being available in that ecosystem. So even if something is not chemically toxic, we, we still have to recognize that tailings can be a problem. So when you're looking at uh, the different metals, they all have their own story, but uh, you know, uh, gold mines, you know, we're dealing with grams per tonne. So for every tonne of ore you process, you get a tonne of tailings pretty much. With iron ore, you now probably 80, 90% of the material you uh, process uh, becomes saleable product. And so only 10 to 20% um, actually becomes tailings. So there is that sort of variability right across the uh, the industry. But we need to understand all of these, uh, I suppose, the, you know, the characteristics of tailings, um, how they're produced and so on. But largely, we still pretty much manage tailings in the same way we have for decades, and that's an engineered storage dam. Uh, and there's a lot of analogies in the, in the way we look at hydroelectric dams and the way we build those or water storage dams. Uh, but there are some key differences because those are, are storing water. Whereas, of course, a tailings dam is storing uh, solids and water. And this is the, the typical engineering approach we, we use to, to building a tailings dam. Uh, mines typically start small. So you uh, go upstream. So you use, uh, you know, on the, the top left here, we start with an initial starter dike. And then we keep adding uh, new dikes on the upstream side of that dam. Um, or downstream, where we keep adding downstream, you know, and so we uh, increase the area of that dam. Um, and so on. Or you can see examples on the right hand side where you have uh, hybrid approaches as well. All right? And so all of those speak to how we engineer and we design and, and construct our, our tailing stands. In some parts of the world, like uh, Chile, for example, upstream designs are banned because of uh, earthquake risk. Uh, so uh, I'm, you know, certainly some people advocate that upstream should be banned everywhere, but uh, I, I certainly don't do that. But um, but again, we need to make sure we understand the engineering of all of these designs and make sure it's designed properly, built properly, operated properly, and decommissioned properly. Next slide, thanks. All right, yep. Now this is just uh, an estimate I, I put together when I was um, involved with the UN Environment's Global Environmental Outlook a, a few years ago. And what we're trying to uh, basically show here is if you look over the past couple of centuries, so the main sort of line there in the, uh, I suppose the darker purple, the uh, presentation is not uh, that sharp, but um, that dark purple line is the ore grades. In other words, the percent copper in every tonne of uh, ore that's uh, mined. All right. And so when you're looking at um, the amount of copper production, um, along with the amount of tailings that we're producing to produce that copper, there's the other two lines which are just growing exponentially. So if we look at a couple of clicks, you'll see the sort of arrows coming in here and the, the patterns are pretty obvious. So if you've got the uh, decline in grade over the long term, uh, and then you've got that increase, that exponential increase in the amount of tailings. And I think, you know, one thing that's always worth, uh, you know, as a good thought exercise, extrapolate those trends for the next 50 years and see where we get to. So we're already producing a few billion tonnes a year just for the copper sector. All right, so that's a pretty extraordinary amount of waste. All right, and so if we add all of that up, we're dealing with billions upon billions and billions of tons of tailings just for the copper sector. Okay, next one, thanks. Here's our little animations, there we go. And just a, a few clicks, there we go. So there's those animations I was talking about. Okay, so, so again, these are the sort of trends we know. And if you look at different examples around the world, um, each of these have a, uh, an interesting story behind them, but um, the top right here, the main sort of panorama there, that's in South Africa, where they're reprocessing old gold tailings, where if you look at the Witwatersrand, Rand, it's basically White Water River, if you translate that literally. And so uh, these areas used to be springs, they used to be wetlands. And so they're now all full of tailings. 
And so gradually the uh, gold industry in South Africa is reprocessing these tailings, shifting them out of these areas where they're poorly engineered. They weren't required to do much except just deposit the tailings there back in the old days. And so now um, they're basically trying to remediate and rehabilitate these areas and uh, hopefully um, get to the point where they can restore some of these springs and these wetland systems in the area. And so other examples there in the, the bottom uh, middle there, you've got the Mount Keith uh, tailings dam in uh, Western Australia. Um, and for a sense of scale, that's about five kilometers across. Pretty big structure, that one. All right, now the top left, you've got the old uh, tailings dam in uh, the center of Norseman in uh, WA. Uh, and the bottom right there is the, uh, the um, Golden Cross Mine in uh, New Zealand, just near the Wahi Mine, a few hours southeast of, uh, of uh, uh, Auckland there. And so it's an example of a mine that's been closed and rehabilitated um, and seemingly a, a good job, I, I must admit. And so, but there is um, a residual uh, acid mine drainage problem there that they do actually have to treat the uh, seepage water coming out of that tailings dam to make sure it's acceptable for the receiving environment. Okay, next slide, thanks. Now, globally, we, we keep seeing headlines. And I think, uh, you know, the, I think the, the day after Jagger's Fontaine happened, was when Richard happened to ask me to do this seminar, um, and Richard hadn't heard of that yet. So I think we're still seeing these sort of, uh, these really bad accidents. And the last news I saw, I think, was 78 people killed from the, the Jagger's Fontaine failure. Now, one of the problems there is that was a mine that was closed in 1971. And it was sold last year and transferred ownership from uh, from the, a big mining company to a, a small little junior uh, you know, uh, company that represents the community. And so now they've got a tailings dam failure that um, from a site they never operated, they have no financial capacity. And so how does government deal with that? How do we make sure we've got the financial capacity, we've got the, we understand the liabilities and the risks and the, the monitoring is still ongoing. Uh, and so I think that's a huge problem. and and. Who decides what's an acceptable risk? And I, these are these are really important questions. That certainly the the very recent disasters in uh, either Brazil uh, now uh, this year in uh, South Africa, uh, but again we've had our own failure here in uh, Australia, Acadia as well. So um, so that's led the industry to say we need to be doing better. And so they've set up a new uh, global tailing standard. Um, internationally, environmental groups have uh, basically put out their own, which is, which they call safety first. All right and uh, and again, there's uh, you know, different opinions on um, you know, whose is better or whatever. And these are working nicely. These are just some animations of how tailings dam failures happened. And again, the reason why we monitor, and, and it's one of the things I guess I'm always sort of uh, explaining to my students, it's not just the cost of monitoring, it's the value proposition that that generates. All right? And so if you're looking at the value of, uh, you know, that we're, we're getting for that uh, investment in monitoring, we're preventing these types of failures. It's one of the reasons we do maintenance in aircraft or all sorts of things. We make sure we have the data to show that things are safe. And so when we're looking at monitoring, there's a, a whole range of different uh, potential modes of failure. Um, we can see the top left is uh, basically uh, an earthquake or a seismic event. We can see uh, on the top right, it's a piping failure. We can see overtopping on the bottom left um, and also excess pore pressure on the, uh, on the bottom right. So all of our monitoring is designed to give us information so that we can say, right, this is how we can see a potential failure um, occurring and we can make management decisions accordingly. And so prevent, um, ideally prevent that accident from occurring. Next slide, thanks. There we go, just click through those. All right. Again, just acknowledge Peter Deal for that. And uh, in Australia, we have had our own failure. I think in many ways, we've, um, we really dodged a bullet here because we can see where that failure's occurred on that uh, the southwestern corner of the upper tailings dam. And if that happened to be much worse, it could have cascaded and caused uh, you know, quite a catastrophic event. So they were in many ways uh, you know, quite lucky there. Now, what that led to is basically the use of the old Cadia Hill uh, open cut uh, as now the, their storage site for their tailings dams. And old tailings dams, also old open cuts are, you know, can be quite useful in terms of tailings dams these days. Uh, that they do have a finite capacity. And so the other problem with Cadia um, that, that has emerged is of course dust. You're no longer depositing uh, the slurry, the tailings, you no, have, no longer have the water on top of the tailings. And so therefore the tailings are drying out. You've got a, a dust problem you now have to manage as well. And so, so again, you can see the scale of these facilities. They're, they're pretty big. Next slide, thanks. 
Now, typically, when we looked at our, uh, our guidelines, we have uh, fairly stringent guidelines here in Australia. We have our own Australian National Committee on Large Dams. Or, so I think how we deal with the, the legacy issues and, and, and the significance of Jagger's Fontaine is it raises this issue very explicitly. So if we think about 50 years from now, how are we still going to be monitoring and, and, and managing our tailings dam? So and I think that's why it's a really important question that we think about how do we, we fund the monitoring, who manages that data, who makes decisions based on that data and so on. So that's uh, it's a, it's something that I guess we need to have a, a very broad conversation about. Next slide, thanks. So the typical approach we've always used is based on our engineering approach. We've used our groundwater monitoring. We've used geotechnical approaches. Uh, and that's largely focused around either water quality or, uh, or physical stability. We've often used modeling as a part of that. I've done that myself. It's seepage modeling or all sorts of things, stability modeling. Um, and that's served as well. And I think we have to acknowledge that, but um, increasingly it's not enough. It's like necessary, I guess, but it's, it's still insufficient. And especially when we're dealing with legacy sites. And so I think we uh, have to evolve. And I think um, that's one of the things these days is that there's a lot more tools and uh, I suppose uh, you know, quivers in the bow or bows in the quiver that can uh, actually allow us to, to monitor. Next. So this is just some examples of, uh, you know, just pulled them out from various reports, but, but again, we can see the um, you know, groundwater monitoring, whether that's sort of uh, um, pH on the top one or, um, or salinity, for example, and on the right-hand side, we can see a, a particular solute uh, and we can see that you're starting to see breakthrough. So on the right-hand side, you can see that the tailings dam has, um, this bore is monitoring a tailings dam and you can see for about close to 15 years, it's uh, no impact. And then after 15 years, you start to see uh, a gradual rise in concentration. And so that's very, very significant rise um, there. And, uh, and so that's a plume. So we're seeing seepage impacts you know, um, from that tailing stand. All right? And so from a, an engineering point of view, we would say, well, what remediation might we need? Do we need a pump and treat system um, or in situ treatment system or, or something else? But, but monitoring gives us the data on which to be able to make these decisions so we can minimize environmental impacts or, or um, uh, other, other issues. Yep. Next slide, thanks. So when you're looking at the recent dam failures, whether it's Samarco or Brumadinho, they've really highlighted that we have to up our game. We have to get much more uh, you know, real-time monitoring, um, but also a whole range of different technologies. Jagger's Fontaine was, um, was able to be predicted from satellite uh, you know, uh, measurements. So if you look at INSAR as one technique, but, um, but the same with Brumadinho. Uh, Brumadinho, the modeling showed that Brumadinho was, uh, was metastable and was probably going to fail. It was a matter of when. Uh, um, and so when we're looking at these types of things, we can use all of these different technologies now as a way to try and predict which ones are at you know, catastrophic risk of failure very, very soon. Others maybe take um, longer. So it should al al allow us to really get a better handle on, I suppose, what are the high priority sites? Um, and really, has the engineering worked? Are things stable? Uh, is there a risk of a catastrophic failure or not? And so the instrument instrumentation and monitoring, I'll handball that to, to Steve in a second. But I think another important principle that's really, I think, become much more firmly established is the need to have public reporting. If you've got communities, and it's the same here in Australia as it is in uh, you know, all parts of the world, uh, I think it's a fair thing to say that they want that transparency around reporting and the data being made public. Right? So I think this traditional approach where a lot of that assessment of the data and the monitoring and so on was held between the company and, and the um, various government agencies, I think in order to make sure we've got a better case to say, yes, our tailing stamps are safe, Part of that is the transparency and the accountability for that. And so the monitoring data and the public reporting of that, I think is a really important principle. Uh, and that also underpins our financial liability. Uh, if we've got a tailings dam that's safe, then the liability should be pretty low. Uh, but if we've got tailings dams that we can um, uh, verifiably show and need work, or then that liability should be higher. So we can help justify some of these uh, financial aspects from having that um, better data and so on as well. Next slide, thanks. So if we look at globally, mining uh, is producing of, of the order of at least 10 billion tonnes of tailings a year. And that's dominated by sectors like the, you know, the, uh, the copper sector and the gold sector. Um, but in you know, Australia, we're very much a part of that. 
So as uh, Katie has shown, and there's other examples uh, across Australia as there is uh, around the world. And I think our typical approaches, they've been, they're still important, they're still necessary, absolutely, but they're not enough. And they're certainly not enough to uh, really assure communities or investors or, or regulators that our tailing stamps are safe. And so I think that's why we do need a lot more new technologies, um, but also realize that it's, uh, it's never gonna be just one size fits all. We need to have a plethora of different monitoring systems in place, um, but ultimately it comes back to making sure we're managing liability, we've got public reporting of all of that uh, information, and so that we can have confidence in what's happening. So over to you, Steve, thank you. Okay. So let's go back to my pretty picture, thank you. So that is a typical uh, tailings operation. You can see that the, the one that was under development was TSF6. So five times before they've built tailings dams and they outgrown them. Next slide, please. So in a lot of cases, uh, oh, sorry, it's, it's good to have the luxury of putting all your instrumentation sorted in during the design phase, but sometimes it's not. And uh, that photo is of a site I went to where it's got these beautiful curved uh, slip failure cracks occurring at the top of the site. And, um, and there's some seepage down the bottom that, that go with it. And uh, they had to do a fair bit of mucking around to make sure that wasn't going to fall down. When you choose an instrument, you've got to pick one that's going to work over a long time and you've got to make sure it's stable. If you've buried something under a couple of hundred tons, a couple of thousand tons of waste, you're not going to get that instrument back. You're not going to pull it out and recalibrate it. So you've got to be very careful about what instruments you choose. Uh, when you place you, your instrumentation, you have to allow for future construction raising walls, putting a riprap on and dropping rocks on your loggers and things like that. Got to try and avoid all of that. So the, the selection of what you choose and how you implement it is quite important. Next slide, please. So for measuring a phreatic surface, which is uh, to do with pore pressures, um, mostly we use um, pressure sensors and uh, Typically, I'd use a vibrating wire because it chooses, that gives you the best stability. Um, this is on that site that we saw the photo of at the start, and you can see we've run some very long cables through sand and up the up the tailings wall to a to a data logger, and that's going to be there for a long time. Um, and uh, so uh, the, these sensors typically go around the dam floor and at varying depths around the dam walls. These are the areas where we expect pore pressure to show its head and um, often monitoring at the toe of the wall on the outside. Uh, when, you, when you decide where you're going to put your, your sensors, you've got to also decide, you've also got to have a think about um, the geological structure under the dam and around the dam and whether you've got uh, um, aquifers and things like that. It all comes into the placement of the instrument. Um, and like I said, uh, vibrating wires is my preference. Uh, it's a quite a simple technology. It doesn't uh, drift, doesn't need to be recalibrated at intervals and uh, can remain stable for very long periods. Uh, and it's also, it's largely immune to the effects of cable length as opposed to voltage or something like that. Uh, so next slide. Uh, the other instrumentation we want to put in sometimes is to profile the movement of the wall. So there's a couple of ways. Uh, one I've had some exposure to is shape arrays, which is not the best photo, but that one with the green box on top. And that's an array of accelerometers. And uh, if you get any ground movement, the accelerometer will change orientation and you can calculate from those changes in orientation, how the, how the, uh, the wall is moving or not moving. Um, a cheaper solution, but requiring manual intervention is to use inclinometers. Uh, you, you basically drill and install some casing with slots in it at 90 degrees, and you run your little trolley down that casing and you measure the, the, um, the, the deflection as you go down, you pull it up, put it in the 90 degrees 
run it out, run it up, put it in the 180 degrees, put it down, run it up, and, and in the 270 degrees. So you get a, a bunch of readings that will tell you at any depth what the movement is and you're monitoring for changes. Uh, so that's ground profile. Let's move to the next step, please. Now, once you've got cracks happening and you've got something dynamic happening, you would use something like I show there, which is a crack displacement monitor. Um, and uh, essentially, if that peg on the earth stake moves away from the support stake, uh, you know, you know about it. So there's a couple of weaknesses with that, which is if you've got uh, clumsy miners working around there or wildlife to trip over that wire, that's gonna mess things up and scare the daylights out of people. Um, and I've also seen them hit a resonant frequency during the wind and vibrate. Uh, in, in one installation in the northern part of Western Australia, uh, we had some serious concerns about stability. And uh, this was connected to a data logger, which in turn was connected to a mine site radio. And if the data logger ever detected too much movement, it would turn the radio on and the radio would make a pre-recorded announcement for everybody in the pit to get out of Dodge. And uh, until the geotech had gone around and checked whether it was real or not. So very good technology for instantaneous results. If you if you've got some dynamic changes happening on your site. Okay, next one. And and the the newer technologies now you're getting remote sensing, so you can use radar and satellite imagery, photogrammetry, which is uh, coming coming good with the uh, um, ubiquity of drones. Now you can, you can fly over and and using uh, photography. Uh, you can build a 3D model and you can observe changes uh, and that works well. It's also good if you've got contractors on site that, move, that are moving dirt around because you can uh, you can calculate the tonnage of how much they moved and where it's going to and coming from. All right, next slide. Okay. So installation, another thing you've got to put a bit of effort into because that ground is going to settle, it's going to move, and you've got to make sure you don't break those cables. So the image on the left is a uh, cable was pulled through um, a steel pipe to protect it. Uh, you, you can't really see, but in the background there, you can see that they're using rock for facing and, and capping and all that sort of stuff. We don't want rocks to touch your cables at all. The one on the right was a cast structure in the middle of the dam and we had to put a, a sensor below that. And uh, so you can see we've got big heavy steel pipe, concreted it in, we've covered our cable, protected it from any sort of movement so that none of that rock is going to damage the cable. Uh, you, and plus also, I should say that on that site, that was all installed while construction was still in process. So uh, we had to be very careful about machinery movement and stuff. And uh, there was one particular operator, he copped a lot of flak for continually tearing up our cables. Um, the, the piezometer itself has to be protected. And typically that would be installed in a sand filled sock. So that maintains perme permeability. Um, and uh, if you're grouting it, you'd be using a bentonite cement, which also maintains permeability. Then the other thing to be careful of is you have to place your instruments and survey them so you know exactly where they are. You can't just slap them in a hole and think I've got a reading that's good enough. If you're going to build a model of, of the internal uh, waters uh, surfaces, the, the phreatic surface, you need to make sure you know exactly where those sensors are. Um, and the final thing to be careful of is lightning activity. If you, you've got uh, your mine site out on a very flat plain where thunderstorms roll across, having a spider web of long cables in the ground makes you vulnerable to, um, to nearby lightning strikes, creating potential differences between the sensor and the logger and damaging things. So you need to do some careful design for uh, how you manage that and uh, how you protect from that. Okay, next one.
So we've got our instruments in the ground. We, we're looking after them. We're gonna, we want to decide how we're going to record the data. Uh, the simplest technique is to send the, uh, the uh, new engineer out with the box and take a reading at intervals. And on most sites, the, the parameters or the readings don't change all that fast, but once or twice a week or once a month even is, is enough to keep track of what's going on. Uh, but in these lazier times, we can put uh, data loggers in. So the one on the right is the data logger that has to be sent that, that very same uh, junior engineer out to at intervals and get him to download it to a laptop. Uh, and you would typically log at six hour intervals or something in that order. Uh, the other one is where we had some sites that were a long way from anywhere useful. And so we put uh, radio links in. And so on the top of that antenna, there's a five gig radio link back to, back to base. Uh, we've done some work recently with uh, LoRa based networks, which is low power, long range. And that shows promise. One of the disadvantages of LoRa is it's not a high speed network, but one of the advantages of these applications is you don't need high speed. So next one, please. I should also mention that some of these LoRa devices will go 10 years without a battery change. So it's pretty much set to forget as long as the data keeps pouring in. Next page, please, Richard. So that covers, that's a, that's a bit of a quick coverage of things. So uh, some of the takeaways from what Gavin and I have spoken about. Do you want to talk about your stuff, Gavin, or do you want me to just uh, do it? I can mute myself. There we go. Um, yeah, I, I think we have to recognise the problem's getting worse, and that and that way we're producing more and more tailings. And I, I think we have to make sure that our uh, our monitoring, our management is uh, is is also modernising, also growing in the way that we deal with that. So, um, so I think we've, the way we've dealt with tailing stamps in the past has been pretty good, but um, we need to do better. And I think that that's probably a um, a, a key message from me. And, and then I just want to conclude by stressing about good installation and good instrumentation. It's important to do it properly from the start and don't do it, neglect the system. I, I actually have seen systems where they, uh, they're working okay and then the, the, uh, the new engineer leaves and people forget and the spiders get in there and the rain gets in there and suddenly something's starting to happen. You go out looking for your data and you discover that things haven't been downloaded for a year and batteries are flat and all sorts of nasty things have happened. So please, even though things aren't super dynamic, don't neglect your system and uh, accidents happen. <laughs> so, uh, on this particular job, the, the guys in the loaders were very rough and they kept tearing up my bloody cables and I was a long way from anywhere and it was very hard to get jointing kits and uh, yeah, that's it. Tearing my hair out. That's why I am what I'm like. <laughs> um, so, well, uh, just the last point there is that uh, Hydroterra have a willow stick, which is using um, electrical gradients through through ground to, to measure water flow. And uh, some some of these newer technologies are holding good promise for ongoing monitoring. Well, thanks very much, Steve and Gavin. That was excellent. We have quite a few questions coming in, so we'll move to Q&A, but um, I'd like to ask the first question, um, which sort of relates to your comment initially, Gavin, which was that we've got a lot of good tools like modeling and we've got good at designing these things. Um, and then we've had Steve talking about frequency of measurement and locations, sensors. But sometimes I think the piece of the puzzle that isn't always documented, and I would have thought that the people who should be documenting it uh, would be the people who did the original design part, is just the location and frequency of measurement to confirm that the design is actually performing as expected, I would have thought that should be tied in and mandatory on all tailings dam designs. I was just a bit curious because we had a project come across our desk only a couple of weeks ago where 
the design had been done, but the monitoring locations and measurement frequencies hadn't been spec. So I'm just wondering what your view is in terms of uh, what best practice design is. Does it also constitute the location and frequency of measurement? I, I would think so. I, I, certainly in my experience, look at different minds all, all over the place. So, um, often, you know, different aspects are done by different groups. And so that sometimes they're not joined together or things like that. But I think certainly at some sites I know, you know, really well, um, there is a, you know, there is extensive documentation, but it's uh, often held within the company or by, you know, often um, uh, shared to the regulator to verify, you know, things like safety or uh, environmental compliance and so on. So, um, so I guess there, you know, and there are sites I've, you know, I've worked on where uh, that isn't the case at all. And so there's a, there is a, um, I suppose, a disconnect between some of these types of, uh, you know, aspects of the way we, you know, build, design, operate and monitor sort of tailing stands. So, um, but I think you know, given the scale of the sort of facilities we're dealing with now, and they're, they're generally getting bigger and bigger all the time. So I think that means the risk is getting bigger and bigger all the time. So I think we have to get a lot more systematic and a lot more comprehensive in the way we, we make sure we, we get all of this right. So I think that's hopefully the, the, yeah, one of the key things. Thanks for that. I'm just going to check if we put the early bird questions in. Yeah, they are on the end. All right, so thanks. We've got a lot of early bird questions, so we better charge on. Um, got a 14 questions lined up already. So the early bird questions, um, let's get stuck into that. So these are questions to both of you, really. Is it still a problem in the mining industry that they attempt Can you see that at your end, Kevin? Technical problems. Yep, I, I can see it, Richard. So is, is it still a problem in the mining industry that they attempt to use their tailing stamps for water storage? Um, I haven't actually seen tailing stamps used for water storage. In most cases, they decant the liqueur out of the middle of the dam and put it into an evaporation pond uh, just to make sure that they don't get too much poor pressure and the problems associated with that. Does that answer the question, or do you want to add in something in there, Gary? Uh, I can you know, add some extra thoughts if you like it. Um, I mean, certainly there are some dams where there's a, a much uh, you know, bigger buildup of water than than expected, uh, and that can certainly exacerbate seepage problems at some sites. But um, but typically the water storage, no, I mean tailing stamps are built largely to store the solids, uh, and depending on the site and the climatic context and so on, there can, there's certainly a lot of variability there, but. Um, but for the most part, as, as, as you're saying, Steve, I think, yeah, the, the mines are managing their water balance. They have to. It's a, it's a significant risk. If there's too much water in a tailings dam, a lot of our failure modes uh, revolve around water. So we, we don't want to be you know, storing too much water in our tailings dams. And often that's going to be poor quality water. So um, we don't want to be building up a lot of excess inventory of poor quality water either. So, so typically, I think these things are sort of fairly well uh, understood. But um, a lot of that is very site specific. And so a lot of that needs to be very carefully you know, monitored and assessed at each site. Okay, so I can see my questions now, Steve. So I'll take over again. Sure. Uh, question two, other types of dams for products such as industrial wastes, how viable in central Australia for cattle stations? Mm, not sure, probably a bit beyond my sort of thinking, I'd guess, but it's some, um, Cattle stations that normally wouldn't have large sort of storage dams. I mean, you've got large water storage dams for things like uh, cotton, for example. But um, yeah, not sure about that question. I don't know. Any other thoughts, Steve? Uh, look, I'm not not quite sure what the question is um, because the industrial waste is usually carted out of urban areas, and Central Australian cattle stations are usually a long way from urban areas. Yep. Uh, I would think there'd be a more economical way of, of dealing with the industrial waste. It's good to say some lateral thinking, though. All right. Uh, on belt. <laughs> next question. Seepage management. Um, I guess they're asking about how to manage that from a, where you have seepage occurring. Yep. I, I'll go first, if you like, Steve. I mean, I, I think the, the first point is there will be seepage. The question is how much, where does it go, and then what impacts there are. I think that, that that's really the way we have to frame seepage. Now, from an engineering point of view, you would always want to minimise the amount of seepage, and 
if I had uh, you know, a dollar that I was told every tailings dam doesn't leak, I'd, uh, I certainly wouldn't be rich, but I'd probably be better off. But um, so I think we always have to assume there will be some seepage and then work out where it's likely to travel to and what the potential impacts of that are. And there's certainly some cases uh, of mines I've worked on where those where it has been very badly managed. And there are some sites where it's been very well managed. So I, th I think you can certainly see the full spectrum there, but it, it's uh, an, an ongoing problem and it's something we need to be very, um, yeah, very fussy about, I think, yeah. In, in most cases I've seen, they've put a tow drain around the base of the wall and uh, moisture sensors. So I, I didn't mention moisture monitoring, but you can stick them in, yep. the, in the drains and give yourself an idea of how much it, uh, almost free water flow is in the drain. Um, take it away and again, pump it somewhere where it can evaporate it or deal with it. And um, we've used various geophysical tools like Willow Stick to track where the seepage is actually going. It's, um, it's effective for that application. So, um, yep. There's a few different ways to manage seepage. Um, obviously some are instrumentation, some are geophysics. Okay, on to the next question. Mine closure and monitoring aspects. I guess this is after we've closed, how long should we monitor for and how? What's your view on that? Yeah. How far down the rabbit hole do we want to go? I, I don't think we've got really many case studies where we've monitored beyond 10 years. You know, I don't think that's something that we need to fix. We need to be monitoring for a lot longer than 10 years. And Dagus Fontaine, the failure occurred 50 years afterwards. Now, when we're looking at what that means for modern mines and whether you know, Acadia or, or many others of the different dams that are out there, um, we need to be thinking about monitoring for decades beyond. And I think that that's something that we're only just starting to get our heads around. Um, how do we you know, uh, finance that? Uh, who's responsible, the reporting, the data and all of that sort of stuff. So all of those things, we know we, we, we need to keep monitoring, whether it's seepage, whether it's stability, whether it's uh, ecological restoration of a, you know, the, the cover of the top of the tailings dam, for example. There's a whole range of things we know we need to keep monitoring for. Right? Uh, how long we keep monitoring for will be very site specific, but we need to make sure we've got to a point where we're stable, where we're, it, it's safe. And I think that's, uh, that's going to take decades. And in terms of monitoring too, I'd, I'd also be interested to see how many people here could, could get their hands on it Windows XP laptop running some uh, downloading software that's uh, from a company that's been long disappeared or swallowed up. Um, and that's that's part of the 10 year thing, you know, like I, I wouldn't give much more than 10 years for any operating system and, and data loggers. Uh, if they're, you know, if they've been orphaned in the process and no good to you anymore. Makes sense. I think that's a, a really valid point, uh, along with the um, maintenance of those systems. You know, it, um, yeah. often often ignored and slowly but surely the networks go offline. Um, I, I was interested, Gavin. You made a comment earlier about um, you know that typically it's the regulator and the mine that are, are the people who know what's going on. Um, and then, uh, but but why is that an issue really? Like the regulator's job is to, to regulate them. Um, don't you think that putting it out into the public domain is just potentially going to confuse people rather than help the problem? Like isn't the regulator qualified to assess the, the problem and aren't they acting on our behalf? Oh, it's a great question, Richard, but um, regulators sometimes get it wrong. You know, companies sometimes get it wrong uh, and sometimes communities get it wrong. I think we have to be honest about all of that. Right? And so uh, Mount Polly is a great example of that, where the regulator and the company um, you know, both underestimated the, uh, the, the potential for failure there. The consultants uh, you know, to the company there uh, had actually seen it and they'd, they'd, um, they'd actually written to the regulator saying uh, effectively in Morse code, but uh, yes, we're worried. You know, and um, that worry was not acted upon. So I think there's some, um, you know, there are times when uh, we do get it wrong and then that's how we've got failures. And so I think 
we need to be asking that question. So, right, well, we need to make sure our regular regulators are resourced. They've got uh, the, the expertise there. Um, and, and same within the companies. And I think that's been one of the things that's been really good to see over you know, the last couple of years is a real um, a reinvigoration of uh, uh, commitment to expertise and careers within tailing stamps in the, in the big mining companies. So I think we need to be doing all of that and, uh, and more. But I think another part of it is, uh, is, that, um, is that transparency because there are uh, commitments or you know, promises being made, whether it's to communities or investors or, or regulators about safety. So we need to make sure that there are as many eyes on that as possible. And I think that's the way we can get the, the, you know, the, the best safe outcomes. It's been interesting to look at the various models that have been tried, like almost independent oversight committees, and I know you've been involved in a few. Um, so I think the model probably exists, but maybe uh, it needs to be mandated across the industry. Um, better move on to the next question. Sorry. So IoT and connectivity options for sensors in tailings dam monitoring. That's probably my area. Um, yes, I, I'm seeing now uh, low power wireless coming into use. Uh, last slide I did use the um, uh, RST product, which is a Canadian, uh, yeah, Canadian company, and they are using Zigbee, which is a bit like LoRa. Um, and uh, we got very good connectivity with a couple of base stations, and uh, they were in fact telemetering their data out of the loggers into their SCADA system with alarms and all the usual stuff. Um, works well and it's getting better. What about satellite side of things, Steve? Are you seeing that being used more? Um, I'm just trying to remember if I've seen much in the way of satellite. Uh, satellites up till now has been quite expensive. And uh, for, for a site that's got 10 or 20 or 30, uh, sensors around the, the dam wall, it can get quite expensive and, and certainly cheaper to send a junior engineer out at times. So with anything electronic, you've still got to maintain batteries and, and uh, solar panels and all that sort of stuff. So there is an ongoing cost, no matter how simple it makes the gathering of the data. Yeah, it'd be, be interesting to look at that again in the light of some of these sort of um, micro satellites and the like that have come out in the last couple of years, just in terms of whether they can be applied for this sort of monitoring. Uh, 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 we're certainly seeing more in that area. Yeah, the, the question to ask is, are they going to last more than that 10 years? Yeah. Um, certainly the Iridium satellite system went up. Uh, from Motorola, I think, put it up and they never even put the full constellation of satellites up and then they went bust and now, it's, I can't remember what it's called now, but, uh, you know, it's just the bit, the business of trying to run a satellite system for data is just, the, the value's not there. And now with the ubiquity of mobile phones, um, most remote sites will have a satellite link to a, a local um, mobile tower and, and the people on site and the telemetry gear is all running over cellular data. Right. All right. Um, thanks for that, Steve. What is the current level of interest from the community in tailings dam management? Good uh, yeah, go with that one. I think there is a broad interest and I, and I think it varies depending on where you are. At the international level, you've got uh, all sorts of different NGOs that have got their, have come together to create the, their safety first standard. Uh, and that's been in response to the, uh, to the failures. And so I think uh, depending on what part of the world you're in, uh, yeah, there will be very significant interest. And so I think, um, and a lot of that will revolve around safety, uh, but also it's um, just around, you know, as we we're talking about before, the, the regulators, companies and things like that as well. So there's certainly a lot of interest because it's uh, people are concerned. If things go wrong, they can be very catastrophic. And so we need to make sure that we are uh, monitoring and managing our tailing stamps in a way that we, we don't have accidents. So hence the, you know, the, the, the uh, name of the, co the code or guideline for the you know, NGO community is safety first. Yeah, it certainly seems to be growing 
I mean, it's as you said, there's more tailings and there's been some big failures. So I think the public industry interest is pretty high these days. Um, dike wall stability. This is probably you, Gavin, initially, I would have thought. Well, I think a lot of these things, it, it's um, whether you, uh, with a tailings dam, you've got your dike walls and things like that. So you've got your internal structures inside a tailings dam, um, as well as your main, um, you know, ring dikes and, uh, and things like that. So um, they can be quite important, but it depends on how you're managing tailings, what the regulatory requirements, you know, will allow or not allow. Um, but again, so all of those things need to be looked at. It's, um, but yeah, I'm not quite sure exactly what else the, the question's getting at there, but it's, um, but certainly it's part of making sure we understand our, the management of our tailings. Steve, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, no. Oh. All right, well, I think the next question's for you, Steve. Yeah, that's my baby, vibrating wire. I'm a big fan of vibrating wire. It's such a simple technique um, and it's largely immune to um, cable length, immune to uh, electrical noise and things like that. So it provides a very stable long-term instrument and quite, I quite happily bury one of those and expect it to keep on working. Um, the, the technology is quite simple. It's just basically a guitar string stretched between a diaphragm and the frame of the instrument and you're just measuring the frequency. So there's no temperature effect on, on cable resistance or anything like that. And I think they're perfect for this application. Given all of that, when wouldn't you use a VWP? I uh, don't know. You certainly wouldn't <laughs> bury one for long term if it wasn't VWP. Uh, on stuff that's a bit more accessible, like um, moisture monitoring around tow dams, uh, tow, tow drains, uh, you could put different technologies in and... Uh, I guess it comes down to price, doesn't it? it? You know, if you want an instrument that's going to last a long time, you might have to pay a little bit more. Um, one of the problems with vibrating wire is you actually need a specialised interface on your data locker to make use of it, as opposed to something that's 4 to 20 milliamp or voltage or something like that. So costs a little bit more, a bit harder to manage in that, in that regard, but um, so you know, it depends who's paying, paying the bills. They might have slightly different opinions. That's always the problem, isn't it? Generally, yeah. Um, okay, so that was a lot of early bird questions. Thanks very much for everyone who emailed those through. Now over to today's questions in the Q&A. What has been done to remediate gold mining tailings? Hmm. Um, reprocessing them often, um, and sometimes they're left there. Um, there's certainly, if you're looking at Western Australia, there's a, a, a been a rapid growth in the use of in-pit tailings for the gold sector. Uh, and there's certainly no shortage of pits in Western Australia for gold, so there's uh, plenty of opportunity there. Um, but I think one of the, the problems, and I, and I think this is an issue that sort of popped up in a few of the different uh, you know, questions there and comments in the Q&A box, um, is that a lot of gold mines will be... Uh, put into care and maintenance, um, maybe five, 10, even 30 years later, there'll be more exploration work done and uh, a new mine project, uh, project uh, you know, um, put in place. And so the old tailings then becomes a new one. And um, so I think that's often a, a approach you see. So um, there are some sites where a tailings dam is actually you know, formally uh, remediated and rehabilitated. Um, so there's certainly some like that. And uh, Kidston's probably one of the examples that the industry used to um, you know, love to promote, but um, so there's certainly you know, different things out there, but uh, often I, know, I think there's still residual gold left in gold tailings. And so often one of the best things we do to find a use for gold uh, tailings is to reprocess it and then, uh, and then find it uh, often a different site for uh, long-term storage. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Next question, regarding legacy tailings dams, I've been waiting every year to hear the tailings dam of the Rio Tinto Gove operation in Nullumbi Northern Territory has collapsed. Unstable mountain of incredibly alkaline tailings next to a bay in a cyclone zone. 
Um, I suppose it hasn't collapsed, but uh, I'm not sure how much you want to comment on that. It's probably a bit tricky because it's a specific site. Well, it, it's a site. I mean, I've, I've never been there myself, but I, I certainly have colleagues and friends that, that, that work there. Um, it's an issue. Like uh, we, we know that uh, you know, red mud tailings uh, has to be very carefully managed. It's quite alkaline, and so on. So um, it's it's a it's a problem. We need to make sure. I think we've got that transparency around it. And I think that's one of the key points. Hopefully, I've, I've been able to you know, help justify is that rather than worrying about it potentially failing all the time, we should be in the opposite position where we can say, yeah, we have confidence that it's everything's in good order. And I think that that's the position we really should be aiming to get to and actually make sure we achieve. Yeah, and that's a good goal to aim for. Thanks for that. Uh, next question. We have new technology, which could be especially useful on legacy dams, but adoption of this technology appears to be slow. What do you think can be done to help educate the market to prevent future catastrophic failures? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think it's not just about the, you know, the market. I think it's also about the regulators, but also about the community. And I, I think a lot of it is understanding that that risk is there. And so uh, in, in, when I've been in different parts of the RAND in South Africa, the community are, are certainly very aware of, of their tailings dams and, and, the, and the, you know, the issues going on, uh, whether it's water pollution from acid mine drainage, whether it's the potential for failure. So I think there's certainly, it's a multifaceted sort of approach. I think... What you're looking at is that uh, we need to ed educate the regulators, the companies, often the consultants, um, but we also need to work out how to fund it all. all right? And I think that's one of the other problems that when you're dealing with legacy sites, governments don't have much budget to apply to cleaning up or, or, or remediating legacy sites. So we need to come up with a system that allows us to come up with the funding process for that. And there are examples, the Northern Territory, for example, has a, a, a mining legacy fund and 1% levy is uh, put on all operating mines, and that goes into this mining legacy fund, which they're using to, to clean up some of these old legacy sites. Now, if that was adopted uh, nationally, we'd have hundreds of millions of dollars a year on which to go and clean up legacy sites. So I think there are, there are models out there, um, you know, and it's kind of the, the super fund type model, I guess, in, you know, that used to operate in the US. So um, I think that's part of the way we get that education out there it's got to be the regulators, the companies, uh, and uh, as well as working with communities as well. But I think there's a range of solutions, but it's 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 a process, not just a you know a single point, I guess. Well, the super fund was certainly successful in you know, driving remediation of polluted sites in the US. That's a pretty yep. well tested model. Yep. Um, next question. G'day, Gavin. I'm all for transparency, but how do you provide the data when large portions of the public are not literate in the technical aspects of these reports and studies? How do you get the right level of transparency without creating unnecessary concerns for the public that aren't able to understand the data and terminology? It's a good question. Thanks, Ben. It's um, great to cross paths again. It's um. I think it's the stuff we've always been doing. We, we have uh, really detailed technical reports and then there's summary reports or there's uh, you know, uh, other approaches we can use as well. But uh, I remember being out at a tailings dam in New Zealand once where you know, I was touring the, a particular mine with the community there and the, the company were being very open. And the community asked me, you know, well, how would we you know, know whether the company um, would, uh, whether there was an earthquake, whether this tailings dam would be safe? And so I turned to the engineer and said, well, where's the monitoring data? So he picked out the book, showed me all the, you know, pork, uh, the pizos, the pork pressures, and uh, where all the monitoring bores were. Um, and they showed me where they've got their factor of uh, you know, safety analyses done and, and everything. I said, well, there you go. It's, yeah, this is a pretty safe dam. Um, the manager was saying he wouldn't be worried about a tailings dam failure because he'd be more worried about the, the local gorge uh, destroying the highway out of town. But... Um, which I thought was a rather odd response, really. It's uh, a tailing stamp failure is significant regardless of what else happens. But um, so I think we have to address that concern. And I, and I think, yeah, there, there is potential for that, Ben. And I, I don't think we could, you know, we, we can avoid that. But um, we have to make sure that I think uh, the reverse situation where we don't have information and, and there is that uncertainty, that's a much worse situation to be in, all right, where 
I think you're creating a lot worse concern by having that uncertainty, by not knowing. All right. So we do need to get better, I think, at making sure we translate our, um, what the data means. And there's various ways to do that. Um, and I think there are some good models out there. And the state of the environment style reports are, are, are one approach. All right. So, um, so it's, it's an issue, absolutely. But I think we, we can address that. Um, but I think we have to address that. And I think to the, the position of saying, well, we don't have anything transparent and, and in the public realm, I think only creates uh, a lot worse sort of uncertainty and therefore uh, more concern, I think. So, so I think we have to do it um, and we have to then work out how we get it right. Uh, so that would be my approach. But hopefully that answers your question there, Ben. It's, it's interesting, um, the, the use of the Internet of Things and the ability to you know, in real time, create virtual variables does provide the opportunity for very timely reporting of agreed metrics, right? That would not have been possible like 10 years ago and and could be published in a, in a public domain. So maybe there's a part of the process which is a declaration of what the key indicators are and yep. they can simplify the outputs like you say. Um, definitely remember, um, capable of doing it. Yeah, I remember a really good example of something that's kind of similar. There was an incinerator in Japan that uh, was burning industrial waste. And so they were always required to operate above 2000 degrees. And so the, in a, and the community understood that if you operated at a lower temperature than that, you're at risk of forming dioxins. And so the uh, solution to that was a 36 foot neon sign at the front of the, uh, the, the incinerator linked to a temperature gauge. And so the company knew that if that temperature gauge, you know, the display ever dropped below 2000 degrees, they'd get a cavalcade of phone calls. Um, and it never did, right? Because they, were, they had that simple metric, as you're saying, and it was displayed publicly. And so that way the public had confidence that everything was working properly. So, so sometimes there may be some simple solutions um, like that. And that for an incinerator, that one works well. Tailing sounds to more complex, but, um, but yeah, we can, there's probably other ways we can deal with that. Yep. All right, thanks for that. Um, next question. Currently, it is seen that various displacement rate alert levels, low, medium, moderate, are being proposed for INSAR at tailings dams. How could these displacement relationships be defined for each dam since it is observed that they are highly variable? Steve, do you want to go that one first or me too? Or? Um, yeah, I think you go for that. I think the movement at each dam is going to be very site specific. So I think a lot of these things, you can't just, it's not a, a single quantitative number that we have to say is low, medium or moderate or, or extreme. Um, uh, and so, and I think, you know, monitoring of things like, uh, you know, earth movements, whether it's in, uh, you, know, uh, you know, slope stability uh, failures or things like that. There's other examples where this sort of monitoring is being used. Uh, but I guess for, for tailing dams, what we need to be able to work out is what's the significance, you know, with respect to failure risk um, or the impact downstream. They're the sort of questions I think we really need to focus on. And so a lot of the, the alert levels or the, the risk assessment um, will have to be done at a, at a site specific sort of basis. So, um, and I think that's why you'll see they're, they're all highly variable, but that, that'd sort of be my thoughts for the moment. A next question is from Dinesh. Have deep rooted tree stands been used to stabilize tailing dam slopes? Yes, uh, but um, do they actually work while well, variable? <laughs> Sometimes I've, I've seen examples where tree, tree roots have actually helped destabilize uh, you know, walls, and I've seen other times when they, they clearly have actually helped to. Uh, uh, to stabilize them but, but again it also <laughs> depends whether we're talking physical stability to repeat that Gavin sorry okay. the internet's okay. not working too well. um other times of course we're seeing uh, issues with um uh, infiltration so uh, infiltration so it's um it's tricky but yeah you got extra thoughts there steve I think what we heard there is yes, where trees have been used for vacation, has an experience. 
start again. There's pros and cons, I guess. Back. You seem to have a bad connection occurring. Uh, um, we might move to the next question. Sorry about that, but I think um, the answer to that is yes sometimes. Are IoT solutions such as LoRaWAN preferred over traditional cabled sensor solutions? Is LoRa cost competitive? Steve, that's your question. Yeah, I, I don't, don't know if I can answer preferred just yet. There are some big advantages with low power, long range wireless. Um, and there are some disadvantages to cabling. In terms of cost, it's quite cheap. If you're paying $3 a meter for cable and running out a kilometer of cable, you, you, you basically bought yourself a LoRa station. So um, I, I think as that technology becomes more um, accessible, then, that uh, it would start to take preference. Uh, again, we still have the long issue of if the technology changes, can you still support it? Piece of wire is always a piece of wire, but uh, uh, equipment manufactured by people who go out of business uh, becomes unsupportable and that has to factor into your decision-making process. I guess the flip side of that is um, you could probably pr replace a fair few um, LoRa you know, transmitters before you'd uh, got to the cost of the cabling with its installation. So, Absolutely. So I think what we're seeing is, uh, yes, we're starting to embrace more of those sorts of telemetered solutions and um, they're very promising. Um, mines never close, they go into care and maintenance just in case it becomes economical to mine again. There's a fair bit of truth in that. What do you think, Gavin? Yeah, I think that uh, that comment, I guess the next couple of comments, they're all sort of very closely related. So um, yeah, we're all worth batting up together, but certainly, um, if you look at the gold sector, absolutely. You know, um, uh, and there's extremely few mines we've actually closed and rehabilitated and then monitored for a long time. You know, so um, a lot of them do get closed and then reopened again. All right. And so we're, we're seeing that um, uh, all over the place, I guess. So um, the question becomes, and I think this is sort of the, you know, especially the, the third question down about the um, regulation and, um, and the, you know, the, the Northern Territory is an example, but um, is how do we make sure we're still regulating these things to, to maintain the monitoring, maintain the stability assessments, uh, so that we aren't leaving this liability for future generations or for um, in case a company goes bankrupt and then of course government has to step in and, and, and fund that liability or um, you know, pay for the cost of remediation, et cetera. So I think that's a, that's a really difficult question and I don't think any state's got a great solution to that yet. I think the NT model, as, as much as sometimes we often um, you know, point to mines in the Northern Territory, but the NT model of the Mining Legacy Fund, I think, is a good one. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's one that I think was uh, brought in under significant opposition from industry um, and even you know, across various elements of government in the Northern Territory. But it was brought in for the right reasons and it's achieving you know, um, you know, the, the, the right outcomes. And so I think there are models out there. Uh, we need to make sure they're implemented much more consistently right across the board, not just, uh, not just in the Northern Territory, but also elsewhere. Okay, so I think that covers a couple of those questions that are listed there. Um, so we might move. Uh, there's a specific question about a supplier. I think we might skip over that one um, in terms of uh, any conflicts of interest. <laughs> I, I must say um, I, I haven't come across those vibration monitors myself. But I have done a bit of work on uh, micro seismic monitoring, and uh, that was that was in a um, long wall coal mine and in the block caving setup, where we were listening to the and calculating the amount of energy released by all the pops and the creeks as as rock failure occurred. I'm not sure how applicable it is to to a soft material like tailings, whether you would get any useful 
localization going on, um, you might pick up uh, ground movements in the wall. But I've had no experience with that. I'm just wondering if they mean geocon vibrating wire piezometers, but uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, yeah, could could also mean that. Sorry, now that I reread it. I mean, geocon are one of the big suppliers of these globally. That's right. Good reputation. Um, next question from Sudhir. Great presentation and very informative. Would you be able to share? Short answer is. Short answer is yes. yes. I'm happy to share my part. Log yep. in. You can share the yep the the presentations if you log into the Hydroterra website. Uh, under training, you'll find a full a list of all the webinars and their recordings. So feel free to share that link with anyone that you like. Um, Pamela, what are the most used technique to remediate sites impacted by acid mine drainage? Oh, goodness, that's a big question. Yeah, how long's a piece of string? That's a big one, that one. Um, I mean, I'm very simply, I mean, almost every technique you can think of, uh, sometimes uh, you know, using uh, uh, microbes, other times using uh, engineered soil covers, water covers, uh, you know, bulk soil I've seen, like using red mud, the, um, as a, as a treatment method, like the alkalinity from within that and the iron as a, a sorption uh, site. Um, what else? I've seen zero valent um, permeable uh, barriers or reactive barriers sort of put in place, um, pump and treat systems. So I've seen lots of different techniques out there. I guess what I haven't seen um, is a really good long-term monitoring of different sites from, that, have, uh, that are affected by AMD to actually make sure we've got it under control. Um, and there are some, like certainly Captain's Flat out near Canberra is one that was remediated back about 45 odd, 50 years ago. Um, and the covers for there seem to be holding pretty well. There's still a small tail of acid mine drainage there, but it's uh, certainly the Molongo River, uh, yeah, based on the monitoring and the reporting I've seen of that, um, you know, some 30, 40 years afterwards, it's, uh, it certainly seems to be in a, a reasonably good state. So, so the, that small tail of acid mine drainage is certainly not causing as you know, significant impacts ecologically. So I think that's, that to me is the big question there is like, yes, we, we know we've got to recognize you know, how big the problem is um, and work out different ways to remediate the site. But there are sites where we've got it really wrong, like uh, you know, Rum Jungle um, and many others where the remediation hasn't worked that effectively. And so I think that's the sort of one of the key things is we do the remediation, but then we need the long-term monitoring uh, and the transparency around reporting of, uh, of, that, of what that monitoring is showing. And I think that, that's a really important part of the process. Okay, thanks for that. So Larky, last question for Nick Watkins. Um, and thanks very much to the speakers for hanging around for so long today. How could the long-term impact of off-site contaminant transport in groundwater be best regulated? That's a big one. Um, <laughs> with great difficulty. It's a really tricky area because in, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, most of our mines are, are not in areas where there, there's a local groundwater use. Uh, now, there may be some, you know, but, but for the most part, we're not dealing with mines that are next to you know, large groundwater users. Um, so, but a lot of them also, we have to then think about in terms of off-site contaminant transport, whether you've got surface water systems nearby, um, there's mines I've been to where you've got salt lakes next door. And so, uh, and you're dealing with uh, salt lakes that are normally dry systems. And now because of, uh, you know, water associated from mining, they're now um, permanently wet all the time. And so, um, so sometimes there's all of these other questions that we need to think about as well in terms of uh, contaminant transport and, uh, and that, you know, groundwater surface water interaction. So um, I think a lot of it is making sure that we, we ask that question and we do understand what the, what the various risks are, because they will be different in different parts. So, uh, and then uh, it, you know, judged accordingly, I guess, but it's, um, it's a really difficult one, that one, because I think we, for the most part in Australia, a, a lot of our mines are not near communities or near uh, uh, areas of large groundwater use. So, and that's why I think the problem largely gets swept under the aquifer. Swept under the aquifer? <laughs> <laughs> the best I could come up with, Richard, it's a Friday afternoon.
All right. Well, that's um, that's probably enough for the day. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And great to see so many questions. We've got over 21 questions there. And well done to Gavin and Steve on answering those. And uh, if you want to look at the webinar again, please feel free to log into our website and uh, you will see all of the webinar recordings. So thanks very much and see you next week. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye.